All right, thank you for coming, everybody. My name is Trent Fowler, and I, I put this together on behalf of the Da Vinci Institute. So space has always captured the human imagination, but it has not been until relatively recently that we've had the kinds of tools we needed to study it systematically, or the kinds of equipment we needed to go there, because it turns out space is very dangerous. Now that we do, there's all this excitement about the possibilities afforded by a permanent human presence in space. And we hear all this talk about asteroid mining and, and space tourism and most importantly Donald Trump's Space Force. Um, naturally, most of the attention has been focused on the nearest celestial bodies, namely the Moon and Mars. There's a whole subgenre uh, sub of science fiction which deals exclusively settling Mars. But I don't think it's premature for us to begin thinking about what lies beyond that and what further steps we can take. Um, and here to talk to us specifically about this is Michael Carroll, who is a world-renowned space artist and the author of some 29 books, um, three of which, four of which, are for sale back there. And I wanted to grab Michael specifically because while I'm interested in space exploration, it had never occurred to me that anybody was thinking seriously about settling anything besides Mars. There's a lot out there, and uh, Michael's written a number of books and done a lot of research on settling the outer solar system, which just really grabbed my, my attention. So without further ado, Michael Carroll. Thank you, Michael. Uh, thanks so much, Trent. All right. Is this thing working? It is. Yes. It's on going. Beautiful. We have technology. All right. Well. Um, I have already thoroughly enjoyed the evening. Um, lots of uh, different people from different backgrounds and interests, and uh, it's a very Renaissance place, so it's a, a perfect name, the Da Vinci Institute. Um, let's talk a little bit about exploration. You know, um, people are uh, talking a lot these days about Mars. Uh, it's uh, aside from the moon and the asteroids, the easiest place to get to. Uh, it's the most Earth-like environment uh, in some ways. Uh, there have been studies, you saw a few up there, by uh, uh, places like the Mars Society and by Lockheed Martin of how you build infrastructure, not only to get there, but to live there. But what if we go a little further? What if we go beyond Mars? The outer solar system seems like a, a nasty place to go, doesn't it? It's very cold, it's very dark, it's a very long way off. Um, light times, uh, radio times to Jupiter are um, over an hour typically. Uh, to Saturn they're uh, even longer. Uh, what are we doing talking about that? Well, the, the outer solar system is rich, rich, rich in resources. Um, people have been thinking about going out there for a long time, of course. Uh, Georges Millet, Les Voyages dans la Lune, The Voyage to the Moon. Um, how many people have seen this? How many people saw it in a movie theater? All right, so there's one. Yes, very good. Um, and uh, it was based loosely on uh, Jules Verne, uh, who based his work on the science of the time. But along came uh, a Spanish director named Segundo de Chomón, and he did a film about a voyage to Jupiter. Now, this is Saturn, obviously. I don't know what it's doing in Voyage to Jupiter, uh, but there it is. Uh, the king of the Earth makes his trip to Jupiter in a dream. And so, in a sense, this is a step back from, from Verne, from, from uh, Millet's film. It's not as, as uh, scientific, it's, it's not as, doesn't involve the critical thinking. It was much more Hollywood, even though it was Spanish. It was 1909, Millet's uh, film was 1902. So uh, we've come a ways from that. Stanley Kubrick gave us 2001, A Space Odyssey. People complained about the fact that you couldn't hear anything in space, but of course he was right, you can't. And we have the movie Alien that, that uh, reinforced that. In space, no one hears you scream. Uh, but Kubrick understood what it takes to get out there. He understood what it would be like to be there. Um, it was not necessarily a, a, a story with a happy ending. To, to my mind, one of the very best uh, modern films 
uh, on the subject is uh, uh, Europa Report. Um, it's a, a scientifically accurate in terms of what we know today. And, and that's the best we can get. When you look at a piece of astronomical art, you watch a film, those are showing us a snippet of a point in history of science. It shows us what scientific thinking was at the time. And, and because of that, they're, they're treasures. Uh, they're great ways of, of learning what uh, was understood at the time. So, wait a minute. Here we are talking about going to Mars and the moon. Why would we be talking about going out there? How could we possibly realistically do that? Well, actually, we've been getting ready for it for some time. Um, if you look back at the, the Polynesian diaspora through all those islands, um, they learned incrementally how to go further and further and further out to sea. Um, they could spot land from very far away by the change in color on the bottom of clouds. By the difference in the currents, they could tell where land was, what directions. They watched the wildlife, they watched the fish and the birds. But technologically, they became more and more advanced in their vessels. And this is the Hokulea, which uh, was built in Hawaii based on some of the, the great um, canoe ships of the Polynesians. Uh, so just as the Polynesians built better and better things to get out there, we have been incrementally learning how to get further and further out into the cosmos. First, of course, we had our suborbital flights and, and then uh, low Earth orbit, and then we graduated to Mir, we got the International Space Station. These journeys culminated ultimately in translunar flight and finally landing on another body on the moon. Um, aerospace engineers are learning technologies that will enable us to go much further. How are we preparing? Well, just like the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts, we have to learn things on our own. The International Space Station, as it turns out, runs um, about every year or every six month shifts. Now it takes about six months to go to Mars. Uh, NASA is not saying this out loud, but the fact is they are doing a lot of studying of what it takes on a human body to spend that much time in weightlessness going from the Earth to Mars. Uh, the problem, of course, at Mars is that you can't turn around and come back. You have to wait for about 18 months for a launch window to come home if you have a big spacecraft like something that supports people. But um, we have had people on orbit now for years in the International Space Station uh, from lots of different uh, countries. This is the, the favorite spot of all the astronauts. It's the cupola. Um, I actually saw the cupola in Johnson Space Center, and I just didn't think the view was much to talk about. <laughs> I don't know, it's, maybe it's just me. Um, but um, speaking of this incremental learning, we are learning about how to, to spend time on Mars. The Mars Society has set up this Arctic station on Devon Island. It's a very, very remote spot. It's nowhere near any infrastructure. It's just like what it would be like on Mars in that way. Um, and uh, they've been quite successful. The Soviets and now Russians have uh, been doing something called the Mars 500. Uh, actually, they, they were doing things related to it in the Soviet era, but Mars 500 began in 2007 in Moscow. Um, they have had three different crews rotating through this thing, and it's a uh, it's, it's a kick, it's pretty interesting. Um, here's a little diagram of what this place is like. They, they throw these people in this thing and lock them up for forever and ever, and they've got, you can see, different uh, stations. This is the main living area. Um, they hang out here for most of the time, but then when it's time for the Mars mission, they crawl into here, which is built like a Mars lander. There are spacesuits in here, so it's like an airlock, and in here is a Martian landscape. And so they do 30-day 
journeys down to Mars, come back, and then spend a whole bunch of time here coming back to Earth. Uh, added to this, they, they severely um, restrict what they can eat, and the, the communication with the outside has a built-in uh, delay, just like <laughs> it would on Mars. So, so uh, as the mission progresses, that delay gets longer and longer and longer. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty tough place. I mean, it would be like camping for 500 days. And I'm not that big a fan of camping. Um, the final mission was 520 days long. Three Russian members, the European Space Agency, supplied a uh, French participant and an Italian Colombian subject. Uh, the Chinese rounded it out with one of their astronauts. They climbed in June 3rd. 2010 came out uh, 520 days later, and uh, that is one trip I would not like to be on. <laughs> so we have some problems. One of which is time, right? How do you how do you spend all that time with a limited number of people in a very cramped space and uh, not see a blue sky for? Uh, for uh, a couple of years, really, if you're going to Mars and, the, and going to the outer solar system, all the problems are multiplied. So we've got to figure out some, some other things to do. Now, the uh, one thought is that you put people to sleep, you put them into hibernation. Um, Fred Hutchison Center in Seattle is doing some studies where they are uh, slowing down the metabolism severely so that cancer treatments can catch up to the tumor. They slow the tumor growth down by slowing down the metabolism of the person. They essentially put them in a coma and then uh, tr treat the cancer. Um, but they are learning from this how to uh, induce comas and then healthy uh, ways of bringing people out of them. Uh, ESA, the European Space Agency, um, has studied three-stage hibernation, natural hibernation, and a couple of different creatures, uh, squirrels and marmots. And uh, so these things show some promise. The nice thing about all this is if you put somebody to sleep, they don't breathe as much, they certainly don't eat as much, and they don't argue. So. Uh, so this may be a great thing to do. Now this picture, of course, is from Alien, and we all know how that came out, so it might not be the best example to use here. But the other solution, though, is to get there faster. Mars is a long ways out, okay? It's uh, six months if you are on a small unmanned spacecraft, eight months for a, uh, the technology that we have now for a manned spacecraft, a piloted one. But uh, there are other engines that are being tested now. One is called the Vasimir, which is a variable specific impulse magnetoplasma rocket. Anybody heard of the Vasimir? Okay, very good. So you can correct me. <laughs> um, this is a, a fascinating approach. Franklin Cheng Diaz is a former uh, space shuttle astronaut. He was the very first Puerto Rican NASA astronaut. Uh, the guy is brilliant and really a neat guy. We've uh, spoken on the phone before. Uh, what the Vasimir does is it uses microwaves to heat propellant, turns that propellant uh, into plasma, okay? And we've had spacecraft that uh, have, have done similar things before. The Dawn spacecraft most recently at uh, Vesta and Ceres and the Hayabusa 2, which is currently uh, circling uh, Yugu, an asteroid. Uh, these things had this very gradual approach. They, they turn on their engine for a long time, accelerate slowly to get to where they're going. The nice thing about them, though, is that you can run an engine for a long time. The problem is the engines are very weak. Um, Dawn and Deep Space One uh, had engines that had a power similar to a hair dryer. Okay? Uh, there's a hall thruster, a slightly different kind of ion engine that's a little more powerful. Um, it's about uh, five kilowatts. It was a kilowatt for Dawn. Uh, so that's like five 
pair of dryers. That's where we're making progress, right? But the Vasimir, the difference with the Vasimir is that it can process a lot of power. It can take, if you plug it into a really big nuclear reactor, which we have not been able to send to space yet, um, it can uh, uh, travel essentially with the power of an SUV. Okay? Now that is constant power. Okay? That's not a one-shot deal. You turn it on and you've got that power uh, at hand we're constantly accelerating out. So uh, Chang Diaz thinks that we can get to Mars in about six weeks rather than eight months with a Vasimir, okay? The time, flight times to Jupiter are cut down by many, many years. So propulsion, new propulsion systems are going to enable us to do things in the outer solar system. It may seem a bit odd to be thinking about um, going to the outer solar system anytime soon. But let's run the tape back just a little more than a century. The average family in the Americas, and in particular North America, operated on about three horsepower, okay? Everybody have a, an average of about three horses. About 50 years later, we had airplanes had a thousand horsepower. Okay? That's a lot more, right? Now, we have airplanes that take off every day that have a thousand times that much. They have essentially a hundred thousand times the power uh, that the average family had a little over a century ago. That's equivalent to the combined armies of Genghis Khan. And these things take off multiple times a day. These kind of advances are what we hope to see uh, coming up. And there's nothing to say that it's not going to happen. We just have different challenges, different engineering challenges. But the, the, the lines of progress uh, seem to be fairly consistent. And so um, when we solve the transportation problems of getting out there, uh, it's going to um, help immensely. But let's think for a minute about what we would see out there. Why go? What's interesting? What's boring? We'll skip the boring stuff. Let's go to the interesting stuff. Uh, the gas and ice giants are huge, huge planets. Really exciting things. Dwarf uh, the Earth. That You could put uh, 1,100 Earths inside of Jupiter. Okay, These things are very, very big deals. Uh, very alien environments. You can't go land on Jupiter, there's no solid surface. The, the core is solid, in fact it's more dense than the core of the Earth, but as you move out from that core it becomes less and less <coughs> dense and then it's liquid and then it's gas and then it's air. But there's no nice delineation between the solid and the atmosphere, so you can't go land there. You can though uh, hang out in the atmosphere. Uh, of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. This is a little painting I did of some, some buoyant stations on Uranus. You can see the rings out there and a couple of the moons. The problem is that most of the uh, atmosphere is hydrogen. And so it's tough to get a balloon out there to float, right? <laughs> Very hard. Hydrogen is the, the thinnest gas, and there it is. Uh, so what you have to do is heat it. You have to heat these stuff. Uh, one idea is to make the balloons black so that solar heating uh, makes them buoyant. Um, so that's one possibility. But you know, the, the easiest places to, to explore and to uh, witness the wonders of the outer solar system are the moons. Uh, there are four giant moons of Jupiter called the what? Galileans, yes. Guess why? Because they were found by Galileo. Very good. He did not invent the telescope, by the way, but he uh, retooled telescopes that were fairly common in those days. There's, they were sold at carnivals, traveling uh, fairs and things. Uh, he took one and, and uh, revamped the lenses and the uh, eyepiece and, and instead of uh, looking at his neighbors, which everybody else was doing, he looked up. 
at the moon, and he discovered these star-like things trembling back and forth around Jupiter. One of those was Io. Here's Io. Every spot you see on this little moon, it's about the size of our moon, uh, is volcanically related. Well, Io has about 600 active volcanoes, which is slightly more than the entire surface of the Earth, including the ocean floor. Okay? This is a very, very active little world. You can see a volcano squirting up about 200 kilometers there on the edge. It would be a fun place to explore, but there are some real problems with Io. Uh, not, not the least of which are the volcanoes, but there are some, some nasty things. Oh, let me just show you a couple of uh, beautiful scenes that we might see. This is called Tupan Caldera. And if we set ourselves down here, looking out this way, we would probably, oh no, over here, that's right, <laughs> we would see a scene something like this. There is uh, Europa and Ganymede up in the sky. Um, it would be, these green areas are called golf courses. Uh, they're green not because they're grassy, there's no air, but uh, they're green because of the minerals in them. They're not completely sure what those are at this point. Uh, this is a beautiful painting by Marilyn Flynn of an area called uh, Samshu, uh, beautiful near uh, equatorial area on Io. There are mountains to be scaled, caves to be explored. This is uh, looking straight down but the interesting thing about Amirani, this is a volcano called Amirani, is the source is right around here. But the eruptions are coming out all over here, squirting straight up at us. There is a whole network of subsurface lava tubes down there that are feeding those things. In this case, it was probably molten sulfur rather than uh, molten rock. Here's the problem with Io. <laughs> Uh, REM is the amount of radiation you can handle before you turn to jelly. Uh, for a human being, 500 REM uh, is about all you can take in 24 hours. That's about going to kill you. On IO, a day will give you 3,600. It's a nasty place. Europa is further out, but you still get an almost deadly amount per day on Europa. Uh, the radiation is coming from Jupiter. Jupiter is the brightest radiation source in the solar system besides the sun. It's a very, very powerful magnetosphere. So how do you get around that? Well, there are all kinds of these underground structures like lava tubes. And so you could imagine kind of hanging out inside a lava tube and building a habitat and such. Uh, the problem, of course, is that sometimes they fill up again. And so you have to be careful and vigilant. Uh, the next moon out, however, is a much better candidate for tourists and certainly for life. And that is Europa. Europa has an ocean that's uh, at, at some depths, uh, some sites, probably 100 kilometers deep, 60 miles or so. Um, it's, uh, it looks like a fractured eggshell. And this is a diagram of the radiation. This is actually uh, in my novel about Europa back there. We'll talk about that in a minute. But as you can see, there's the radiation is nasty on the trailing hemisphere, but it dies down up here. You can actually live pretty comfortably in these two spots on the moon. So, so what we have to do is learn about the environment that we're going to if we're going to live off it and survive it. Uh, there will be places that are sheltered, uh, like this. We will need uh, advances in all kinds of technology. Apollo suits had essentially no uh, radiation shielding, even though those astronauts were outside of the uh, protective magnetosphere. Um, we timed every mission so that it was uh, the, the solar, it was across the solar minimum. In 1972, it was getting nerve-wracking because the sun was beginning to ramp up again. Uh, but every 11 years, it gets quiet. And in 
1969. It was just at about the low point of that cycle. So Apollo didn't have it. Uh, certainly the suits that are used on ISS and the shuttle don't have radiation shielding. They don't need it because they're within low Earth orbit, you're protected by the Earth's magnetic bubble. Uh, but NASA is working on the Z2, which is a suit for deep space. And it is going to have some radiation shielding. Um, you're probably on a place like Io going to need a, an iron umbrella. <laughs> so they're also studying how to live out there, um, how to build a house. Um, there are plans for um, or kind of tuna can-like habitats, but one habitat that's very promising is an inflatable one. You can make a big habitat from a very little compartment, and this is a one-third scale model at Johnson Space Center of an inflated habitat. So what they were doing with this actually is they were clipping these little supportive straps to see when the thing would blow up. Wouldn't that be a great job, blowing up habitat? Cats, I, it just sounds fun to me. Um, so you can imagine a, ha a habitat like this, scaled up on Europa, here's a, an airlock, uh, but there's a problem. There's a problem with all of these cold places that we might go, all the icy ones, and that is this. If you build a structure on top of something that has permafrost, it's going to melt through it. This is right outside of Fairbanks, Alaska. And this house melted its way through uh, the tundra. So uh, what you have to do, and what they do in places like Barrow, which is where I took this picture, is you put things up on uh, stilts or you put them on platforms. So we would need a platform for our uh, our th thing here that gives us an Earth environment, and then you'd want to, if you're going to stay there for a while, and of course, you decorate things. <laughs> Europa is a fun place because it is full of hints that something strange is going on down there under the ice. Uh, there are domes, there are pits, there are cracks. We know that uh, most of these things are probably due to the movement of ice on top of a very deep ocean. That's very exciting because it's almost uh, uh, given that the core of Europa is subjected to tidal friction that creates the same volcanoes that Io has. So that means that it's likely there are volcanoes on the ocean floor on Europa. There's not as much tidal heating there, but there is substantial heating, which means that uh, every place on Earth that you have volcanoes on the, the ocean floor, you have rich life, and that life is completely cut off from the sun. This life on Europa would be protected from that radiation environment, and um, who knows? There might even be shipwrecks. You never know. But can we do anything with this? Remember, we want to live off the land when we go out there. Can we take advantage? of these radiation fields in any way. Well, there's a scientist at the European Space Agency, um, uh, Claudio Bombardelli, who is Italian, and he's come up with this great idea of uh, stretching tethers. Now, his paper talked about tethers in orbit around Jupiter, sopping up that energy in effect and, uh, and trans transferring it to something usable. You could also do that on the surface of the moon, and in one of my novels, I, I have them doing that to power a, an outpost on Europa, which is uh, uh, one likely way of doing that. So there's another interesting thing that uh, Bob Papalardo at JPL uh, mentioned to me, and that is if you're near the equator on Europa, and you're in a place where Jupiter is down by the horizon, uh, something interesting happens. All of the satellites, all of the main satellites of the outer planets are tidally locked. That means that they keep the same face toward that planet. Uh, our moon is tidally locked with us. We can't see the far side. Jupiter, or um, Pluto and Charon are tidally locked. They both face each other. But on Europa, it librates a little 
it wiggles as it circles Jupiter. And so if you looked carefully at the position of Jupiter on the horizon and set yourself up some kind of Stonehenge, you could actually tell what time it was, what time of the day, just by the position of Jupiter. It's a lot of work, but you wouldn't have to pull your cell phone out of your spacesuit. It's an advantage, right? There are other great places around Jupiter. The biggest moon in the solar system is Ganymede, yes. Beautiful, beautiful Ganymede. It has a subsurface ocean as well, but it's locked between layers of ice. Um, really neat place, though. Uh, there are uh, icy terrains that are unlike anything we've ever seen. Some of them are a little reminiscent of Europa. It has ghost craters called palimpsests. Anybody know what a palimpsest is? All right, it is. Um, so if you are a scholar of ancient manuscripts, you will know this. An ancient manuscript that was done on parchment, uh, parchment was very expensive, and so what they would do is they would use milk and razor, some kind of blade, to scrape off the writing and they would reuse it. But archaeologists can look at those with x-rays and infrared and they can see the ancient writing beneath the other stuff that's put on top and that's called the palimpsest. Well, so are the ghost craters on Ganymede. So a little useless party fact for you. <laughs> Here are some of the strange terrains on Ganymede. It would be a, a magnificent place to explore. Um, let me give you uh, just a couple of lines from a guy who is an expert uh, on Ganymede. He said, the dark terrain might be the equivalent of the lunar highlands, except with these amazing albedo contrasts of the bright icy slopes, the dark dusty material down in the bottoms of craters and troughs. I love talking to scientists who are excited. He's excited about going to Ganymede. The furthest of the Galileans, Callisto, is a dead world, essentially, uh, in terms of geology. It's ancient, ancient cratered face, and um, there are these weird icy things sticking up out of this dark regolith, this dark dirt, okay? Um, but if you were a tourist, this would be a great place to go. The radiation is down, way, way down. You wouldn't need lead underwear anymore like you do on Ganymede or Europa. And these things, they look a little like penitentes in, in the Andes, okay? Uh, ice spikes, but they're about the scale of what we see in Monument Valley, the buttes there. And so I think um, it would look something like this as you were wandering around tourists on Callisto, and someday you will have. I guarantee it. But the next place out, the next big stop, is of course the Lord of the Rings, Saturn. Beautiful rings planet. Uh, it's uh, got some of the same problems that Jupiter does in terms of, of living in the clouds, but it doesn't have the, the deadly radiation, and it's got tons of moons, kind of mid-sized moons, smaller than the Galileans, uh, but, uh, but interesting moons nevertheless. Enceladus, is full of active geysers squirting 400 kilometers into the airless sky and creating a big ring of fog around Saturn itself. Ron Miller envisions a, an interplanetary uh, geyser park on Enceladus. So there are future tourists looking at the stuff leaking out of the ocean. And that ocean is global. We have seen that the crust actually moves, and so we know that it's detached from the core. There's the ocean completely surrounding that core, which makes it another great target for astrobiology. Um, here we are about to explore that ocean using a submarine. Why is there a dome there? Anybody want to guess? Keep the water liquid, yes. It's, what happens is if you open a conduit down to the ocean, it's gonna squirt out like all those geysers. You have to pressurize it so that it's stable. Then you can drop your submarine down. Sounds like an easy engineering feat, doesn't it? 
maybe not, but that's okay. Um, another great moon out there, fascinating world, is uh, Iapetus. It has a ridge that is something like the Himalayas in scale, goes around the equator. It looks like a cheap red rubber ball with a seam around the, the middle. And uh, it would be a magnificent view from Iapetus to Saturn. So uh, my friend Aldo Spadoni, uh, who was with Northrop Grumman, and he works with Hollywood, a uh, very talented designer, he designed this, this Iapetus resort, and we put it there on the ridge with Saturn up in the sky. Who wants to go to Iapetus? All right, me too. We'll meet there. Um, the most fascinating moon is Saturn. Some would say the most fascinating in the solar system is, where are we? Titan, Titan yes. A uh, moon that has more atmosphere than a good Italian restaurant. Uh, it has 1.5 times the air pressure that we have at sea level, okay? A lot of air, a lot of stuff going on in that air. It's mostly nitrogen. There's only one other planet in the solar system that's mostly nitrogen in the air, and what is that? Here, Here. you're breathing it, yes. We breathe mostly nitrogen. The secondary gas is oxygen here. There, it is methane. So it rains water here. It rains liquid methane, that cryogenic type. Here it is compared to the Earth. It's almost as big as Mercury. This is a painting I did for JPL showing a specific possible cryovolcanic site, Cote Arcus. There's rainstorms in the background. And uh, this is one of those methane seas, about the size of the Black Sea. It's called Kraken there. And that island, for scale, Maida Insula, is about the size of the big island of Hawaii. Okay? So these are large, large liquid structures. People have been trying uh, to figure out good ways of, of checking these things out uh, with blimps. It's a, Titan is the easiest place to fly. It's a one-eighth of a G. There's not much gravity, and yet there's tons of air. So a human could actually fly under their own power on Titan, which is, makes it another nice tourist spot. Uh, there have been proposals to send boats into those liquid methane baths up there. Beyond that comes Uranus. Here we are, here's the Earth compared to Uranus. We could put 16 of our worlds in it, and it has a whole bunch of fascinating worlds, many of which have been wracked by cryovolcanism, very, very cold uh, volcanic activity. Uh, look at the, the strange, lovely canyons down uh, down south on there, um, if you put yourself in one of those, uh, it might look something like this. I would love to explore those canyons. You see flow features in them that indicate there may have been geologic activity. Right next door is Miranda, one of the weirdest moons in the solar system. We think that as it differentiated, as the heavy stuff settled to the core, and the light stuff went out, that it was hit by a big impact of it scrambled it and it froze this way with some of the inside stuff up near the surface. Um, one thing that that did was uh, aside from leaving these strange uh, coronae, these, these weird linear things, it left this cliff. This is a huge cliff. Verona Rupi. Verona Rupis is the tallest cliff in the entire solar system. Here's the Grand Canyon. Anybody been to the Grand Canyon here? It's a pretty amazing place, isn't it? It's a gravel pit compared to Verona Rupes. Here is the canyon at the bottom, and let's compare it to Verona Rupes behind. This is a scale image to show how dramatic that would be. Imagine base jumping from the summit of Verona. It'd be pretty cool. Until you land, you'd have to plan that ahead. Triton, this will be just about our last stop tonight. Another great tourist attraction. Why? It has its own kind of volcanoes. It's a be it has beautiful views of Neptune. Uh, but all these dark streaks 
are a volcanism that is unlike anything we have seen in the rest of the solar system. Um, in fact, Voyager was able to glimpse uh, several erupting volcanoes, and there's one at the top of this image. I'm going to trace it for you. Ready? Here we go. There it is. It comes up straight for eight kilometers, about five miles, and then it hits a high altitude jet stream. There's not much air there, so this wind must really be howling uh, in that upper atmosphere. So all these dark streaks are from volcanoes that uh, that are created by something called the solid state greenhouse effect. Methane and nitrogen ice are much clearer than water ice, okay? Sunlight can penetrate deep into that ice, and as it does, it warms up the ice deep down inside, and that ice sublimates, it becomes a gas, okay? That gas builds up and finally explodes out through that ice. We haven't seen that anywhere else except possibly a couple spots on Mars in the equatorial regions, but that's very um, controversial research. So anyway, this is what those strange geysers would look like. And it's a lovely place, beautiful, strange, alien, icy environment. And just, just imagine putting yourself there. I would love to be standing there watching those strange geysers wafting up into this dark, dark sky. JPL's uh, Kevin Baines envisions future tourism in the Saturnian system as being a lot like traveling through the Caribbean or the Greek Isles. He says this, it would be a great tourist destination. It's like going to the Greek islands on a cruise ship. Each Greek isle is unique. It's the same with the moons of Saturn. So you can imagine day trips maybe from an orbit around uh, Titan to the yin and yang landscapes of, of Iapetus, the battered highlands of some of the other moons like Minos or, or Tethys and the geysers of Enceladus. Lots to see out there. Cruise ships docking at different moon ports it would be fascinating. And of course, you would, you would just spend the day hovering over those rings. This is the B ring outside of Saturn, that's Tethys and Mimas up in the sky. Here comes Enceladus on the right. And there are these shark fin-like um, ripples at the edge of the ring caused by the gravity of these small moons within the ring system. Those things are almost uh, twice as tall as Mount Everest, okay? So, so everything about the scale out there is very, very different from here. Do we 21st century humans see ourselves as, as conquerors of nature, of the wilderness out there, using the environment around us merely to serve the needs of humanity? It's, uh, it's difficult to think of wilderness as, as something other than something to be conquered when it's a, a, a super chilled vacuum environment, deadly place. But, or, on the other hand, do we see ourselves as an integral part of that nature? Do we perceive wilderness as having intrinsic value? Do we stand somewhere in between? Our fuzzy telescopic maps have blossomed into real territories of mountain and desert, canyon and cloud, and, and map makers, armed with their new clear views, put names to those canyons and mountains. There's power in the name. It lays ambiguity in concrete. It sets down secure borders, brings definition to the unfocused. So the worlds out there went from Tharby dragons to places where we could put our boots. When we stand before giants, we're humbled by their immense power, their majestic beauty, vast moon systems that dwarf everything that we understand in this terrestrial environment that we live in. But they motivate us. They motivate us to explore. They inspire us. They push our technologies and our frontiers. Those technologies enhance quality of life on Earth, right? And the wilderness of the giant worlds informs our culture, our society, our arts, and our perspective. 
But that's what you would expect from a giant. Thank you very much. Um, I did bring some books tonight. If you're interested in such things, I'd be happy to sign them. Uh, living on, living among giants, and uh, then there are three novels as part of Springer's science and fiction series. These are fun because they have a novel in the front and then a little section in the back about the science behind the story. So they're they're heavily researched. So um, I think we have. Do we have time for a little Q and A? There was yes, sir. Yeah. So in your mind, which is the first um, planet? So after the moon and asteroids, uh, and after Mars, well, do you think Mars? Would be I think Mars is going to be the first planet. Yeah, the so first what, tradition. What time frame do you think for Mars? Ooh. Well, um, so I think that there may, may be some forays to it fairly early on, maybe within the next uh, 30 years. That would be wonderful because all throughout my lifetime, Mars has been 20 years away. <laughs> we'll go to Mars in 20 years. That's what they always told us. Um, but I do think that we'll be there within the next 20 or 30. But the scale will be limited, I think. Which is a shame. I think that we need to go to Mars as an international group with international partners really stepping forward to uh, donate or to contribute to the key technologies as well as the personnel. Um, that has worked in the past. There were some uh, events in the Cold War that only uh, didn't happen, disasters that didn't happen because the scientists were still speaking. The politicians had shut down, but the back door was still open. And there were these back door channels that had been established by the science community that kept things going, kept people talking. And so I think that that uh, dynamic is sadly still alive and well with some nations like uh, Korea and China. But I think that if we learn to get together and get along a little better, uh, we will have a very successful uh, movement to Mars. It, it needs to not be flags and footprints like the moon was. We need to set down infrastructure from the get-go, I think. And that's the wisest approach, I think. Um, after Mars, it's got to be Jupiter and uh, some of the Galilean satellites. So, and I leave, and, and uh, there, there is a mission that is being tooled right now to go to Europa. Um, if we continue to study things out there and we decide that there is life in the ocean out there, uh, that will change everything. That will move timelines up. Okay. Yes? Based on NASA's uh, cost of about 10 million, or 10, excuse me, 10 billion dollars per person to make a round trip to Mars and yeah. survivable round trip, um, is there anything there valuable enough to go after? A and um, so if, if, if not, if, if this will be a donation. There won't really be an um, economic payoff for any time soon. So do you advocate um, taking money from people or a voluntary contribution? <laughs> and if it's a voluntary contribution, how much are you contributing? <laughs> well, that is a good. So we're going to pass a bucket right now for Mars. I'll take care of it. It's okay. Um, no, these are these are the questions that we need to be asking ourselves. These exact questions, um, and the answers have changed over time. We have seen with the Apollo program that um, there was a tremendous trickle down effect. Uh, not only technologically, uh, one of the folks who was on the Constellation Project told me that it, the value of Apollo wasn't so much the widgets we got out of it, the technology. Instead, we learned how to do big things. 
We understood quality control in a way that we never had before. We understood how to operate large systems of people. Apollo um, employed 400,000 people at its peak. Okay, it contributed to the economy. You don't, when you build a spacecraft, all the money doesn't go into space. It goes to the families of the engineers. It goes to the infrastructure that built it. So there's great value in exploration of space. But there are big price tags, and you have to decide where you want to spend that money and how much. Is it better to send a sophisticated rover than to send a person? It's a whole lot cheaper, right? So these are the questions that we will need to ask ourselves, and the answers will change as the technology changes. Um, and I can't put a price on it. Can you? How much would you give? Um, I haven't given anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you have if you paid your taxes. You've given a little. Each of us contributed about the cost of a Starbucks short coffee to the Spirit and Opportunity Rovers got a pretty good return from that cup of coffee. So, um, all right. So, I hope that kind of gets out right yeah. Yes? So you didn't, you didn't mention anything about radiation after Jupiter. I'm assuming it's like even in Saturn, it must be much, much reduced. Right. The, <clears throat> the radiation environment of all the other giant worlds is very benign compared to Jupiter. Jupiter is essentially a a star that didn't quite make it. Um, in fact, Isaac Asimov said of the solar system that it consists of the sun and Jupiter and a few other things. Uh, and so uh, if you took all the other planets and their moons, including the Galileans, and put them on one side of a scale and put Jupiter on the other side, Jupiter would still be more massive. So it's very, very large, very different from <laughs> the other Saturn is almost as big, but it's really much less dense. They say if you could find a bathtub big enough to put Saturn in, it would float. But you wouldn't want to because it would leave a nasty ring. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yes? Looking at it from an economic perspective, could you say something about the potential, potential of mining minerals on these other planets? Yeah, I mean, a lot of work has, is being done now on asteroids. Um, it's going to be a long time before we can economically make sense of mining on a planet. But an asteroid's different because getting there and getting back is a whole lot easier. It's a very low delta V. You don't have to take a lot of fuel, burn a lot of fuel to get there and get back. Um, so asteroids uh, may be the next next big mining uh, landscape. And um, the world stores of things like copper are running a little bit low. It's conceivable that as technology demands uh, more and more of these precious metals, it will make more sense to mine the asteroids. And, and again, our technology is, our enabling technologies are coming along. So, so that may, I think, be the next, next big uh, step. Yeah. Um, yes. Do you think that'll be cheaper than the ocean under ocean supplies here? I don't think so. I think so oceans will come quite next. a while. Yeah. Yeah. Before it's uh, economically uh, right. Unless how many um, centuries would you say? I have no idea. But the the other thing is, if we can't find what we need in those ocean deposits. Then we start. We'll start looking at the asteroid sooner because uh, you can remotely uh, survey an asteroid cheaper than you can some of these ocean spots. So, yes. Back to Jupiter for just a moment. Is um, is it just providence that determine Jupiter's size relative to the other bodies in our solar system, or is there a scientific? Uh, explanation for that? Well, the architecture of our solar system is different than any other architecture we've seen out there. And we have looked at multiple exoplanet systems now. Um, there are a lot of cases where we find Jupiter size or even bigger planets in orbits that are closer than Mercury orbit, orbits our sun. So 
there's something unique about our system. Jupiter is in a perfect spot to actually be a shield to the Earth for incoming asteroids from the, the outer stuff. Um, so, uh, Would that increase its mass or reduce its mass due to impacts? Um, I'm not sure that has much of an effect on it now. Um, it's, uh, the, what was more critical was what happened in the early days. And I'm no dynamicist, I'm not sure, but I do know that Jupiter is not where it used to be. Uh, there's a theory called the Grand Tack, which is gaining momentum now, that says that Jupiter and some of the other giants actually migrated in, pushing the, the asteroids to different locations. Uh, because, and they can tell this by the makeup of the asteroid belt. And then the uh, Uranus and Neptune acted as snow plows, pushing the um, Kuiper belt out. So all this stuff, uh, all this cosmic billiards was going on before anybody was around to see it. But uh, it's clear that the, the solar system today is not what it used to be. So uh, it's fascinating. Uh, area of research. Anything else? Yes? Just, just real quick, what's your thoughts on the SpaceX projections? <laughs> I, think they're, I think they're optimistic, but you know, Elon Musk is an optimistic guy, and he is making a lot of things happen. Um, it's, uh, sometimes it strikes me as a little irresponsible to put dates on things that you would like to do, like sending people to Mars. But there are, <clears throat> there are more than engineering challenges that we have to work out before we send somebody out there. Um, but uh, I love what uh, he is doing technologically. He is working with integrity. He is doing beautiful job of, of the quality of, uh, of products that he's creating to uh, send stuff into space. And, and again, he's a businessman. He's doing this to make money, but he's also a visionary. He's doing it to enable us to go places and do things that we haven't done before. And he's doing it a whole lot cheaper than some governments are. So um, I say more power to him and Blue Origin and some of the other companies, private companies that are are uh, entering the fray um, that is completely changing the landscape. And I think a lot of people think it's high time that we let uh, private industry equip us with, uh, with stuff to work in low Earth orbit, as Elon Musk is doing, and let NASA do the storming the gates of heaven. That's what they were designed to do. They weren't designed to send Greyhound buses into low Earth orbit. And we, NASA lost its way at some point, and I think it's time for them to get back in the exploration business. And there are a lot of people at NASA who share that vision. I, I sh don't mean to imply that they're a bunch of bureaucrats, they're not. There are, are visionary people in NASA as well as in some of these private sectors, and that's, that's where the future is, really. Yes? So this is a very big question, but just looking at everything going on, um, what you're talking about is you know is very, very exciting, very you know very visionary and so on. But looking at everything going on, what do you think the will of our of our people to <coughs> fund, whether it be government, private, whatever, or internationally? and to organize and to cooperate at that level that you're talking about. Um, in other words, is the environment conducive? I know during the 60s we had, you know, the Apollo program and so on, and there was sort of a will behind it. Right. Or we had leadership behind it. Yeah. So my question is, where's the leadership coming from to do what you're talking mm -hmm. about? Yeah, I think it's, from a practical standpoint, it's not there yet. Um, Apollo, people always talk about the, the Cold War and how that inspired Apollo, but there was so much more to it, socioeconomically, culturally, 
uh, was a perfect storm, a time when people wanted to do bigger things than had been done before. Um, Kennedy could have made that speech and appealed to um, the, the Soviet Union as uh, you know a force that was going to be going there also, but if different things weren't happening culturally, nobody would have cared. Let the Russians go, right? That's not what happened. That's not what happened. This nation was ready to dream. This nation was ready to pull itself out of uh, the darkness of, of war and poverty and do something big that could change the game. And until that happens again, until the geopolitical stage is set, uh, these things are not going to happen. But I think they will happen. I don't know when, but I think they will. Can I? Uh, yeah, some of yes. Ideas? Go ahead. I have two things. First, okay. a comment on Mars, and then, a, and then a question. So about the Mars question, we are going to Mars 2033. That's the date that's set. And it's a thousand day mission round trip. So those are the parameters that everybody's working towards. Um, I think Elon Musk and his activity is helping is helping to push that to go further because, like you said, NASA shouldn't be doing the they should be storming the demons. You know, they are helping and they are um, the foundation for Mars. But what happens is all that research that we do going to Mars helps everything on Earth. So I think to answer your question, the economic reason is because we get so much every time we go. And all that research helps commercialization go forward. So all these buses that are coming, like Boeing, um, SpaceX, and Blue Origin, they're using all the technology that NASA discovered in order to enable their business. So I just have to my good. little commercial yeah. there. But what I want to do, I saw, I mean, all your pictures are so beautiful and the scale. One of the things that went through my mind is, you know, are humans ready to become little again? You know, we're the biggest thing in the universe that we know. And looking at all the scales, so what are your thoughts as we go and explore further and further That's about our question. ability to engage and still be okay <laughs> as we go and discover yeah. things that are bigger and grander than ourselves? I, I think that is the beauty and the appeal of space exploration. There are so many things that we have put in little boxes in our culture. You can't do that with the cosmos. It's too big. And that's good for us. That's very good for us. Uh, we need to be humbled now and then. So I think, should we wrap it up? Just quickly, the James Webb telescope yes. launched in 2021. Can you see where it will help as we move forward in this work? It's, um, it, it, that has been a real mixed bag. The planetary science community tried to get it killed about a decade ago because it was sopping all the money up from every other uh, NASA uh, planetary program. But uh, it's, we're committed to it. It looks like it's going to go in a few years and it will be an amazing instrument. It will be um, great for uh, all kinds of studies that we have not yet been able to do from Earth orbit. So, all right, or near Earth space, I guess I should say. So, thank you all so much. Thank you.